Has God ever refused you? Have you ever prayed a prayer, covered the facts, presented the possibilities, argued your case with God, only to have God do nothing at all on your benefit? I think most of us can identify with that. You pray, God, take this away from me. God, remove this temptation. Make me strong so I can resist. But God refuses the answer because he knows something that you don't know. cannot add to it and you can't take way away from it. We are forgiven for our, of our sins, accepted into God's family, and we're going to spend eternity in heaven because of what Jesus did, and that's all there is. There is nothing more. There's nothing you can do, and there's nothing that I can do. God, who knew our sin, loved us while we were still committing our sins. He loved us so much that he paid the price for our sin anyway. But the blood that Jesus shed wasn't only for the sins of our past, but the blood that he shed was for all sin. The blood that he shed was for every man, it was shed for every woman, and it was shed for every child. The blood of Jesus was shed for good people, and it was shed for evil people. His blood was shed for the rich, and it was shed for the poor. Christ's blood was shed for popes and presidents and pastors and paupers. When Jesus' blood was poured out on Calvary, it was poured out for all people, great and small, because everyone needed the same cure. Jesus died for everybody. He died for the Muslims. He died for the Hindus. He died for the Buddhists. And he died for the Baptists. He died for the Catholics. And the, he died for the Protestants. He died for the Gentiles and the Jews. Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross for everyone. And then he rose on the third day to set us all free. That's all there is to the story. That's all there is. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price to break the curse that fell upon every man. He paid the debt for all sin. He didn't just pay the debt for past sins, but he paid the debt for present sins and for future sins. But sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we walk away from the cross and we forget about what Christ did for us. We forget that he was the only one qualified to do the job. We forget that he, he was the only one who was holy enough and powerful enough to pull it off. Sometimes we forget. We forget that we were nothing more than the dust of the ground, frail and weak in our flesh and dependent solely on God for absolutely everything in our existence. When we forget about God, we tend to focus on ourselves, And when we focus on ourselves, we forget about God. When we do that, our ego grows, and it grows until we exalt ourselves higher than we ought to be and begin to honor ourselves above God. You know, somebody will say to me, well, I don't believe the Bible because it was written by men. Really? And who are you to decide that? You see? You see the problem? When we're being focused on ourselves, what we think is what matters. What we believe is what counts. What we want to do and what we want to receive and what we want to give and we want, what we want for ourselves becomes our objective. Our flesh takes over and our spirit is relegated to a secondary role. And it's at those times that God has to humble us and show us once again that he is God. Have you ever been humbled? Raise your hand if you've been humbled. If not, we'll get around to you. I've been humbled a lot of times. I have children. You, can't, you can put on the dog all you want, but all your kid has to do is open their mouth, and that'll be all she wrote. Parent, if you want to be humbled, sit in on prayer request time in junior church. Pray for daddy that he stops using bad words when he talks to mommy. Pray for mommy that she stops hitting dad with the frying pan. Pray for sister that dad doesn't catch her boyfriend in her bedroom. We have a file on some of you people. There were times in my life when I was humbled because I made the mistake of asking God to keep me humble. If you ask God to keep you humble, then you better brace yourself because God will answer your prayer. Years ago, years ago, when my family sang and traveled, I had made the mistake of praying, God, keep me humble. It sounded like a nice thing to say. I mean, it sounded like a wonderful Christian prayer. I was probably 20 years old, I suppose. Now, back then, you have to get a mental image of this because it makes it even better. We had green plaid Captain Kangaroo suits. 
y'all have to be old enough to know what that looks like, outlines on the pockets and everything, and we had high top platform black patent leather boots. Mm-hmm. I was happening. We sang in a church, and back then we didn't have an electric keyboard, so we had a piano, but we had to pull the piano out a little bit to get the microphones behind it. It was on a platform about this high, not real high, but just about this high. We pulled it out, which slid the piano back dangerously close to the edge. We opened with one of our best fast songs. I mean, we had it going on. When we got to that great big ending, I hit the big notes on the keyboard. I leaned back, and I went right on. Patent leather booties up in the air. <laughs> Thank the Lord we was in a Pentecostal church and the guy in the front row goes, he's got it, hit him again. <laughs> don't ever pray that God keeps you humble if you don't want God to humble you. Sometimes we ask for humility and sometimes we don't, but God who wants to make certain that he always receives the glory will allow those that he loves to not get too big for their britches. There's always seemed to be an unhealthy curiosity surrounding the private lives of famous people. There's something about us that makes us want to hear dirt. We, we like to know when they stumble, where they were when they stumbled, and who they stumbled with. There are nearly 400 gossip magazines sold at newsstands every day, 400,000. And, and these magazines sell by the multiple millions. And, and, of course, we all know that everything they print is true, Right? Many people have a morbid desire to roll up the curtain and gaze into the secret lives of eminent persons. De stories detailing the private habits of public men and women uh, are delicacies for our mind. Books stuffed with idle gossip and trash are sure of a wide circulation if they tell us how princes ate and how movie stars drank and how sports stars slept and how senators partied. But now <laughs> you're in for a treat. Because on Sunday morning, during the pastor's sermon, we're going to be able to satisfy our urge for gossip and minister to the edification at the same time. Because we're going to have unveiled for us in the scripture the secret struggle of the Apostle Paul. This information is enticing because we may not only get to see into Paul's secret closet, but we may also learn of his heavenly visions. We might not only see his private infirmities and his personal struggles, but we just might also learn what caused them. Paul never intended to just provide amusement for the curious when he penned these words, but he wrote what he wrote for a practical purpose. This record wasn't given to us so we could know that this eminent apostle who had abundant revelations from God was humble because he suffered a thorn in the flesh. It wasn't written to satisfy our curiosity, but we're informed that it was written for our profit. Paul is giving us this information for our benefit. The truth he states in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Paul was a good man. Paul was a godly man. He was a righteous and holy man, but he was only a man. He was a saint, but he still had the infirmities of sinners. All too often we elevate people to a level of admiration that they cannot sustain. We are by nature hero worshipers. There are people in our lives that we look up to and we admire, politicians and athletes and musicians and movie stars. We pay to see them. We go out of our way to meet them. We want their autograph and their picture, our picture taken with them so we can prove to our friends that we've met them. We buy their products and we support their causes and we even mimic their behavior because we want heroes. Sadly, some of this has slipped in among God's people. And now we have Christian celebrities. We pay to see them. We sell their products. We sign autographs and sell photographs, but they're just men and they're just women, no different than you or me. They have the same weaknesses and the same needs, and when their body hits the grave, it's going to return to the same dust from which all of us have come. But we want heroes. When we read in our Bible of men like Abraham and Moses and Elijah and Job, when we read about Paul and Peter, we assume that since they are mentioned in God's word, that they're somehow more special than the rest of us. But we're all just men. They were righteous men, godly men, men who served God's purpose well, but they were still just men, susceptible to the same trials and adversities and weaknesses as you and me. But I suggest to you this morning, if you want a real hero, then try Jesus. 
If you want to be, be like somebody, then be like Jesus. If you want to read somebody's book, read his. If you want a poster on your wall, make it of a cross or an empty grave. If you want somebody's signature, then let him sign your heart and mark you as one of his own. The danger that the Apostle Paul faced is the danger that faces every successful person. He says, lest I should be exalted above measure. Unless I should be exalted above what I am worthy to be exalted to. Jesus is always to be first. Our God should receive all of the glory and all of our egos should never go unchecked. So we're informed that Paul has received his thorn in the flesh to serve a purpose in his life. He's received this thorn to keep him humble. But I want you to think about this. Certainly one of the devil's goals wouldn't be Paul's humility. If anything, the devil would want Paul so full of himself that God couldn't use him. But Satan hated Paul's righteousness and Paul's work in God's kingdom so much that he would do anything for an opportunity to attack him. So God used Satan's own bloodlust against him. And God allowed a messenger from Satan to inflict Paul so that through Paul's weakness, he would maintain his humility. God is so clever. The preventative, Paul says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Paul considered his great trial to be a gift from God. He didn't say there was inflicted upon me a thorn in the flesh. But he said there was given to me this thorn. Charles Spurgeon once said, O child of God, among all the goods of your house, you have not one single article that is a better touch of divine love than your daily cross. You'd love to be read of it. Sometimes it seems too much to bear, but you would lose your greatest treasure if it were withdrawn. Have you ever considered the trial that you're facing to be a blessing? Have you ever thought of your battle as a gift from God? We often gripe and complain when things go wrong, when we have to fight to survive and struggle to move forward, but often at those times we don't see the bigger story. You see, the bigger story is eternity, the timeless future in the perfect heaven in the presence of God. We are going to live forever. When we finally shed this cursed flesh and our spirit steps into a heavenly body, we're going to leave behind everything that is not good. We're going to leave behind our trials. We're going to leave behind our debts. We're going to leave behind our sicknesses and death. We'll leave behind our weaknesses, and we'll leave behind the enemy who has tormented us for our lifetime. We forget that God has created us to live forever, and we sometimes get distracted by a small story. We're sick, but compared to eternity, that's a small story. We're struggling financially, but that's a small story. Someone we love has died, but that's a small story. We're trying to remove the thorn from someone's eye, but it's a small story. We're worried about the economy and terrorism and the mayhem in our day, but those two are small stories in the grand scheme of eternity. God has already written the complete story. Somebody hearing me? God has already written the complete story. God has already written everything, and he's put that story in our hands. God has already told us everything from the beginning to the end and beyond, but because we don't read it and we don't believe it, we get distracted by these small stories. We're depressed and we're afraid and we're defeated and insecure because we refuse to see the big picture. But God sees the complete story, and he gives to us what we need, both pleasant and unpleasant things, so we will finish our course and finish it well. So Paul says, there was given to me a thorn. If the English word used by Paul expresses the exact meaning, and I think that it does, we need to understand the simile here. A thorn is just a little thing. That's all it has to be. A thorn is painful, painful, but it's not lethal. You might think you're going to die, but you're not going to. A thorn isn't a huge, overwhelming affliction, but it's a common and simple matter. But it is still painful. Have you ever been poked with a thorn? A thorn is a sharp thing that pricks and pierces and irritates and lacerates and festers and causes pain, and yet it is almost a secret thing that's not apparent to anyone but the sufferer. You walk through the house in your bare feet, and you step on a needle. Nobody can see it, 
but they could see you hopping around on one leg doing a war dance and yowling at the top of your lungs. Paul had a secret grief somewhere in his life. Now, I don't know where it was, but I do know that it was near his heart. And it was continually irritating him, vexing him, and wounding him. It was painful and it was inconvenient, even though nobody else could see it. That's why we make this mistake of thinking that Paul was perfect and had this perfect life, because we don't see this indivisible suffering. The pains that we despise are seldom fatal, but they're, they're frequently the source of the most intense anguish in our life. A toothache, a headache, an earache, an ingrown toenail. Who knows what I'm talking about? A little hole in your tooth can take you out of the game. An ingrown toenail can cripple you so you can't function. And so it is with a thorn. It sounds like a n nothing. It's just a thorn. Other people might tell us, well, stop being such a big baby. Suck it up, buttercup, because it's just a thorn. But it's our thorn. Nobody will ever understand your thorn like you do. Paul's trial might have been un unknown to other people, but it was painful to him. Most people can't identify with the thorns that we bear. They can't feel compassion or sympathy because our thorn isn't their thorn. The thing that we deal with day in and day out isn't what they deal with. The pain that we feel, they can't feel. And typically, they don't understand our pain. That's why God tells us to be careful when we judge other people. That's why we're to be careful when we're trying to remove this thorn from somebody else's eye when there's this great big wooden beam in our own. We all have secret trials and, uh, that other people are unaware of, so we can't pretend that we are so together and we are so holy that we can judge somebody else's thorn. You understand me? Paul says that it was a thorn in the flesh. Notice the words. Notice where Paul says the thorn is. Paul wasn't tempted in his spirit, but his trial was in the flesh. The evil that he faced, though rejected by his spirit, had an intimate connection with his body. Now, a lot of people have guessed as to what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Rosa Mueller thought that, his, that it was gout. Others thought that it was his eyesight. Some have believed it to be stammering or a hypochondriac tendency. I read where another scholar who suffered from a sexually transmitted disease believed that the Apostle Paul was suffering from the same thing. As I did my research, I generally found a common theme. Every person who had an opinion on what Paul's thorn was identified it with the very thorn they suffered with themselves. Was Paul's thorn a temptation or was it a sin that he struggled with? I don't know, but I wouldn't rule it out even for the apostle Paul. Paul described his thorn as a messenger of Satan. Not as Satan himself. All too often we think that the devil gets credit or he gets the blame for a whole lot of things that he hasn't done. I saw a cartoon one time of the devil sitting on the steps outside of a church on Sunday morning. And he was crying. Somebody came up to him and asked, why are you crying? And the devil said, because the people in there are blaming me for everything. Paul's thorn, the Bible says, was a messenger of Satan. He was one of the devil's errand boys that was sent to buffet him. The word buffet means to cuff him. Now, you young people have no idea of what being cuffed means. To you, being coughed means a policeman has arrested you and he's placed your hands behind your back and he's putting you in handcuffs. But to those of us who are a little bit older, we know what it means to be cuffed. Who knows what it means to be cuffed? Jeff, raise your hand because I know you got it several times. <laughs> being cuffed is when you've been acting up and mom or dad slips up behind you without you knowing it. And they give you a swat upside of the ear with the flat of their hand. It stings like nobody's business. There's a ringing in your ear that you swear will never go away. And you briefly go deaf for a moment on that side. And then the side of your face turns red for a really long time. You go back outside to your friends and you try to act like nothing's happened. But it's written all over your face. And your friends start laughing at you. He said, man, you've been cuffed. 
It's a humiliating experience. It doesn't kill you. It's not a beating. It's not child abuse. It's not lethal or fatal, but it is painful, and it's very humiliating. Paul feels the degradation of being buffeted. He would much rather have done battle with the devil himself. He would rather have put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and wielded the sword of the Spirit and protected himself with the shield of faith and charged the gates of hell. But instead, he was being coughed as though he was a mischievous little boy, and it humbled him. This experience was beneath him. He was the great apostle Paul, the author of much of the New Testament and the seer of heavenly vision, and yet his fight was over a pestering, petty problem with one of Satan's flunkies. The immediate effect was to drive Paul to his knees. He said three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, and any, anything that makes us pray is a blessing. We don't spend near enough uh, our time conversing with God. We talk on the phone and we text our friends, and we waste more time writing meaningless thoughts on Facebook than we do in prayer to God. How can we ever expect a great relationship with the Lord if we spend so little time talking with him? Troubles have a tendency to bring us to our knees. When all is well, the sun's shining, the birds are singing, life is problem-free, we don't feel the need of talking to God. But we're, when we're sitting in a hospital room or pacing up and down the floor in the middle of the night because we don't know where our teenager is or we're about to lose our home because we had just lost our job, prayer comes easy to us. When we've been humbled by our own human weaknesses, when we fail God, not in a major battle for the faith, but in a ridiculous lack of judgment, it eventually drives us to our knees. Paul's problem drove him to his knees, and three times he asked God to deliver him from it, but God refused. Has God ever refused you? Have you ever prayed a prayer, covered the facts, presented the possibilities, argued your case with God, only to have God do nothing at all on your benefit? I think most of us can identify with that. You pray, God, take this away from me. God, remove this temptation. Make me strong so I can resist, but God refuses the answer because he knows something that you don't know. And yet, even though Paul was refused, God still answered his prayer because Paul received from God something that was even better. Something even better than removal of his thorn in the flesh. The Bible says he was given grace from God that enabled him to bear his thorn. Why do, when do we need God's grace? We need it when we sin and when we fail God. The grace of God lifted Paul above his trial and he rejoiced at the thought that he was permitted to suffer so that God could be glorified. He said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. If any man could have been exalted, it would have been the Apostle Paul. Paul had experienced more in the presence of God than a thousand ordinary men. He had been taken by God into the third heaven, the abode of God himself. He had been shown by God things that were too wonderful to tell, and he heard inexpressible things that a mortal man is forbidden to repeat. And yet he spoke of it to no one. Paul could really keep a secret. Fourteen long years had passed, and Paul never told anybody that he'd been caught up into the third heaven. I gather from the way in which he puts it here that he never mentioned it to a soul. Can you imagine keeping something like that a secret? How many people today, if given the opportunity to gaze into the throne room of God, wouldn't jump at the chance to tell everybody? They'd write a book and hold lectures and sell DVDs and T-shirts and ball caps, but not Paul. Paul didn't tell anybody. When Paul finally did tell it, it was dragged out of him. He told it for a purpose. It was only because the Corinthians had denied his apostleship. And they were saying, what does he know concerning divine things? So Paul felt it bound to vindicate his character. Otherwise, he wouldn't have told anyone. And yet when he does speak about it, he speaks modestly. He explains his experience in such a way that it doesn't leave the impression that he was special or an honored man for receiving that revelation. The thorn had served its purpose. In spite of his great experiences, Paul remained a humble servant of God. He kept his ego in check and the glory where it was supposed to be. Maybe you have a thorn. Maybe there's something in your life that nobody else is aware of that torments you day in and day out. You fought with it. You've tried to defeat it, but you can't seem to finish it off. You prayed and you've asked God to remove it, but your thorn is still there. You're convinced that if you didn't have this thorn, you could be almost perfect. It's what's holding you back. You don't know why God still allows it. You don't know why you don't have what it takes to overcome it. It, But you're beginning to learn 
that God's grace is sufficient. When do we need God's grace? We need it when we fail Him. We need God's grace when we sin. We need God's grace when our flesh has overcome our spirit. You may be saved today and on your way to heaven. You may love God with all your heart and your desires to serve Him with every minute of every day. You want to live above sin and you want to be like Christ. You want God the Father to look down at you and say to one of His angels, that one there is mine. Look at how he's living. Look at what she's doing. That's what you want. But in spite of your passion to live righteous, there's something in your life that you struggle with. There's a secret thorn in your flesh that you do battle with day in and day out. It's something that you can't seem to get victory over. But it's something that sometimes gets victory over you. Can you identify? Paul says in verse 21, so I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another work, a law at work in my members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. That sounds like a man with a major struggle. He says it's there all of the time. I can't seem to shake it. I can't get away from it. When I want to do good, evil's right there beside me, tempting me to do wrong. The law that's controlling my flesh is warring against the mind of Christ that's in me. Can you identify? There isn't a Christian alive today who doesn't know what I'm talking about. There isn't a believer who can't identify with Paul's words. You want to do good, but you don't. You don't want to commit sin, but you do. You want to live for God, but you're bound hand and foot face to face with the stinking, rotting flesh of the person you used to be. The dead man, and he's eating away at your life. That's why it has to be about the cross. The devil doesn't want you to look to the cross. He wants you to focus on yourself. And he wants you to look at other people. He wants you to keep looking at your flesh and your good works and your failures and your sins and forget about the cross. He wants you to become so distracted by your thorn that you give up on your purpose. But I want you to know that God's grace is sufficient. Your thorn may drive you to your knees, but when you're on your knees, you're more powerful than you could ever be standing on your feet. Remember this. The one who permitted Paul's thorn and who's permitted your thorn once suffered a crown of thorns himself for the salvation of us all. Maybe you needed to hear this message today. Maybe you've lost your passion and your zeal because the devil has reminded you that you're just a man or you're just a woman. You're not a superhero. You're not a super Christian. You're not perfect. You're just a broken vessel whose only value comes from the one that lives in you. Whatever you're dealing with right now, let it drive you to your knees. Run to the Father. Fall into His grace. Be done with your hiding. There's no reason to wait. Your heart needs a surgeon. Your soul needs a friend. So run to the Father again and again. 